little nervous. Stop that at once. Is Costa Rica an island or is it on the mainland of Central America? Oh, dear. Well, it's one of the two. Mr. Davids, it's nearly 70 years since I left school. Well, that's not the right answer, but it'll do me. <laughs> where are we now, Reg? Uh, we could have been, uh, you know, cloudy or something and couldn't have landed where we were going. <laughs> uh, when we were in Cool and Gatter on Australia's famous Gold Coast, then they couldn't land, so they went straight down to Hobart. That's right! <laughs> And at the same time, next week, we'll once again we get together. This is Jack Davies saying good night and thanks for listening. Hey, cut that out. You spoke. Of course I spoke. That's my business. I was all ready to speak to these people here in the audience and tell them what goes on behind the scenes in radio. And what happens? You cut me off. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, old man. Is, is there anything I can do? Yes, you can stand back while I get out of this frame. It's a bit on the small side. It's only six and a quarter, and I take seven and an eight. Excuse me. That's better. All right, old man. Switch her on. The golden days of radio. That wonderful era when the wireless was given pride of place in the family living room. When millions of listeners sat glued to their sets night after night, their every emotion stirred and controlled by artists who were masters of their trade. The days when laughter was the keynote and sponsors poured big money into lavish productions. This was a time when adventure serials flooded the airwaves and the stars of radio were household names. Stars such as Bob Dyer, Roy Reen Moe, George Wallace, Ada Adelsi and Willie Fennell were known and loved right throughout Australia. But the undisputed king of Australian radio was the one and only Jack Davy. He was an endearing talent with the unique ability to give his listeners exactly what they wanted, entertainment. Colgate Palmolive's Leave Pass and Rise and Shine, two of Jack Davies most popular variety programs of the 1940s, were designed to boost morale during the trying days of World War II. They were broadcast from various Army, Navy and Air Force bases around Australia, with service personnel participating in the quiz segments. Alright, first to the microphone, up this way. Right up close, your name? Uh, Corporal Challen. Corporal Challen, a nice little question for you, one that I think you'll like. Can you tell me the exact length of the Sydney Harbour Bridge? Yeah, 1,762 feet 11 inches in cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, that is correct, but how did, yeah. you, how did you know? You have some oh, well, I was a junior draftsman with the uh, engineers who had built it. <laughs> hey, give me my hand. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here is my spout. I can change my handle or my spout. Tip me over, pour me out. <laughs> All right, next one to the microphone. Your name? Uh, Joseph K. Milk. Joseph K. Milk? <laughs> That's a grand name. You nervous? Yeah, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll call him Shake for short. <laughs> and tell me, where are you from? Well, I'm from Oshkosh. From Oshkosh? <laughs> Gosh, gosh. <laughs> that's very good. I've got a simple question. I think that's one you like. It's right up your alley, Mr. Milk. And it is, uh, what was the name of that little bit of a ship that brought over the Pilgrim Fathers? Well, that should be easy, you know. One of my ancestors came over on that boat, too. <laughs> <laughs> Wallflower? No, no, no. <laughs> No, oh, it's a cornflower. Not the cornflower. <laughs> His one pilgrim is not making a heck of a lot of progress. <laughs> yeah, may I? <laughs> From the audience comes cauliflower. Well, can I help you a little more? Oh, maybe a little. Then. Maybe, maybe I could. Oh, the Mayflower. Right? <laughs> 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 On your way, and over the cash register. The money's all yours. Over this way and right into the microphone. Your name? Corporal McNeese. Corporal? McNeese. McNeese? Yeah. Well, here's a nice easy one. It's one of those nursery rhyme ones. See if you remember way back to when you were just a little fellow. <laughs> yes, sir. <sorry. laughs> uh, why, why can't the sea sleep very well? 
Because the crab bit his bottom. Thank you. <laughs> You're the next one. Right up close. Your name? Private Sutherland. Private Sutherland from? Uh, shh. Oh. The enemy listens. <laughs> the enemy knows. Right up close. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell me this one. And it's very simple. Can you name me four crosses? I'll give you one to start with. That's King's Cross. Everybody knows that. Everybody within reason. <laughs> well, there's the uh, Victoria Cross. That's good. And uh, the Maltese Cross. That's good. Five shillings if you can give me the rest of them. And uh, the Iron Cross. The Iron Cross? Uh, and one more. Come across. <laughs> Thank you very much. Would you give me A? Again, please. That'll be near enough. All right, uh, if you take the introduction, thank you, Mr. Orchestra Leader. Come in when I nod. Thank you very much. Thank you. didn't you? <clears throat> Chorus? My playing? Shall we continue? <coughs> yes. My Valley has become a very famous book and was made into a picture. The setting of the story is where? In South America, in Switzerland, in Wales, in Spain, in Palestine, or in White City? Uh, White City. White City, that's a tennis place. You're thinking of how green, how green was my volley. <laughs> One more guess. Wild. That's very good, that's very good. Give her a All right, come to Jaggy. That's the idea. Right up close. Your name? Private Beckman. Private Beckman. Yes. A nice easy question for you. Fairly hard. This one is 10 shillings. The first recorded accent into the air by man took place over 150 years ago, and the man who achieved this then remarkable feat 
Was whom? De Rosier, Hargrave, Langley, von Zeppelin, or one of the Wright brothers? De Rosier. He was a Frenchman, and uh, he rose to a height of 100 feet in a fire balloon. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> You answer that amazingly. Well, I ought to. Before joining the hours, I passed an exam on aeronautics. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, <coughs> good evening. Good evening, Mr. Daniel. Oh, how do you do? You... <laughs> That's rather nice. I like when they call me by name. They sent me to the gate me by name. I'm he sure said, he did. Yeah, he said, out of the way, Mug. <laughs> All right, a nice easy one for you. Name me four songs that uh, have parts of the body as title, such as uh, A Call to Arms. You got the idea? Yes, Mr. Davy. Good. Uh, first one I'd say was Dark Eyes. Dark Eyes, very good. Beautiful. Uh, the second one I'd say Scatterbrain. Scatterbrain, yes. You're getting a little deep for us, but that's good. <laughs> and Come on, uh, two more. Time here we are again. Here we are again. <laughs> And one more, quick. Um, quick, here goes the gong. Black bottom. <laughs> to all those film fans who are fond of revivals, I am now happy to present two very old talkies. Yes, it's our two old-fashioned girls, Adrian and Elsie. <laughs> Wait, I'm that nervous with the camera here and all. Well, we've got to do it, Elsie. It's a case of noblesse oblige. What's noblesse oblige, Ed? Oh, you wouldn't understand. It's a pre-war word like no. <laughs> Elsie, the foreman down there's making eyes at me. <laughs> oh, Elsie, being amongst all these strong fellas makes me feel such a devil may care. Sometimes I feel I'd like to be good and sozzled just for once. Oh. Yes, good and sozzled. And maybe just sozzled. <laughs> Still, we have got some happy memories of these munition factories. <gasps> Better to have loved and lost than never to have struggled at all. <laughs> all the same, I wish you hadn't gone out for that oxy welder. I don't like his tone. I told him off last night. Why, what did he say? He said I was a refrigerator girl. <laughs> and what did you say? I said, I may be a refrigerator girl, but you're not the one to defrost me. <laughs> Think I might do a bit of good with that foreman, though. <laughs> Elsie, they say he's got a kiss like TNT. Oh, I'd praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. <laughs> you made me love you with actions. Get your note. <clears throat> Point your finger. You made me love you. Shake your head. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. Point your finger. You made me want you. Look enticing. And all the time I knew it. No, not that enticing. Well, you made me happy sometimes. Smile. You made me sad. Wipe the smile. Shake your head. But there were times, dear, you made me feel so bad. Switch off your battery or wear out your engine. Give me, give me what I say for. You know you've got the kind of kisses that I like. Oh, oh, Elsie, don't be silly. You can't get away with that Molly Roberts stuff. Well, as I said before, what's Molly Roberts got that I haven't got? Nothing, but you've had it long. <laughs> Incredible as it may seem, what was essentially a sight act became a top-rating radio program in 1944 when ventriloquist Mal Verco and his dummy Ginger starred in their own radio comedy series. Ginger soon became a favourite with wartime audiences and was made mascot of the Air Training Corps by the chairman of the New South Wales Recruiting Committee, Sir Donald Cameron. Congratulate you most heartily. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any squadron to which you would like particularly to be attached? <laughs> no, I, uh, if you don't mind, sir, I'd like to be attached to all squadrons. Well, uh, that's uh, surely an ambitious desire, Ginger, isn't it? But I think uh, the best thing I can do is to ask my old friend, the Wing Commander Love, to have you appointed as the mascot 
of the Air Training Corps, and then you will be equally interested in all squadrons. And that will be answered. What are you going to do? I mean, do you want to be ground staff or air crew or what? I think ground staff. Ground staff? Yes. I want to stay on terra firma. The more firma, the less terror. ABC band leader Jim Davidson became Major Jim Davidson in 1942, many stars of stage, screen and radio joined him to form the first Australian Army Entertainment Unit to perform in the Middle East and New Guinea. Australian Army Immunity Services have the largest theatrical organisation in the Southern Hemisphere. Altogether we have 22 entertainment units operating wherever Australian troops are engaged. We train them all here. They are brought back to Pagewood for reconditioning and refitting, which is a big job, as the tropics play havoc with scenery and instruments. We have much of Australia's best talent, all do their share of hard work. There's Lou Campara, ace accordionist, film star Grant Taylor takes a bow with a hammer. The famous Shipway twins freshen up on their horizontal bars. Soldier actor Peter Finch rehearses a comedy that will later raise laughs up north. Music arranger is Staff Sergeant Eddie Cordroy, late of the ABC. Sergeant Redmond Phillips pounds out gags for soldier comics while draftsmen design stage settings and scenery which are carried out by a well-equipped art department. Maintaining equipment for all our bands is a tough task under the conditions in which it is used. So we recondition battered old instruments, whether they be euphoniums, trumpets or piano accordions. All this adds up to the day when we're ready to take the road. Let's have a look at a final dress rehearsal. at work in the kitchen of Sydney's stage door canteen. Even the chairman, Marshall Crosby, has a job to do. And the president radio favourite, John Dunn. They're getting ready for the canteen's first birthday party. Trella Wilson sounds a high note among the potatoes. And here is Muriel Steinbeck, who is to play Lady Kingsford Smith in the forthcoming feature of Smithy. Who's this? Yes, Agnes Doyle, the patsy herself, back from big successes in America for an Australian season. Cliff Arnold, the canteen's popular secretary, does his humble bit and as a reward for virtue gets a hot tip for the flying. But enough of that, there's work to be done and John Casabon's there to show you how. Here's that man again, Dick Bentley, connoisseur of cabbages. She loves me, she loves me not. Don't tell me you've got the worms, Dick. Rita Ponsford of Ada and Elsie is very prim among the flowers while Walter Magnus takes time off to show Mavor Drummond the canteen's birthday cake. Babe Scott, that troublesome child, cuts the cake and the party's on. The hostess, attractive Rosalind Kennedale, remembered as one of the stars of Cine Sound's Broken Melody. Established by members of the theatrical screen and radio profession, the stage door canteen needs larger premises to carry on and for the first time is asking for public support. Stage door canteen, good food, good entertainment and a darn good job for the diggers and diggeresses. 
only a few of the many Australian vaudeville stars successfully made the transition from stage to radio. Of these, George Wallace, Bob Dyer and Roy Reen Moe were the most popular, starring in their own radio series for many years. Arthur Moe, while we watch the one and only Moe, Roy Reen, master of mime and specialist in splutter, as he plays the role of the third man in the ring at a charity boxing show for the Police Citizens Boys Clubs. For once, the referee was popular, even if he did break the rules himself. Uh, a moquis of Queensbury rules, of course. Strike me lucky. And he did, poor chap. He's been hit with everything by both opponents. It's all over, but here comes a king-size haymaker that sends the winner down to the boards. Mo had been a headliner on Australia's vaudeville circuit since 1919, teaming with Nat Phillips to form the comedy duo Stiffy and Mo. Would you believe it? Two little things. In 1934, Cine Sound Productions starred Mo in his one and only feature film Strike Me Lucky. But it was an ill-conceived project, lacking the spontaneity of Mo's stage performances. I think they'll require a few stitches, Mr. Lowenstein. You loafer! How can I sell them now? Slightly damaged. Slightly damaged? Get out of my shop! You're sacked! Sacked? Mr. Lowenstein. Mr. Lowenstein. That is your baby, is it not, Mr. Lowenstein? Oh, Mr. Lowenstein. Surely you are not sacking me. Look, Mr. Lowenstein, I'm only a boy. A poor and sophisticated lad who's tried to do his best. Oh. <laughs> Lowy. <laughs> Lowy. <laughs> oh, Mr. Lowy's eye. Don't shut me out this time. Don't shut me out of this cruel world. Think. <laughs> Think about child. Get out and take that brat with you. Very well, Mr. Lowy's time. Oh, go. I'll go, but remember, it's not the coat that makes a man. What is it? The trousers. Get out of my shop. Very well, Mr. Lowenstein. But there's one thing I'd like to say to you before I go. What is it? I never wish to work for a Greek again. But when Mo came to commercial radio in 1946, he appeared in Colgate Palmolive's Calling the Stars. It was here that he teamed with Jack Burgess, Harry Griffiths and Hal Lashwood in a comedy series called Macaki Mansion. A vehicle which brought him to his peak and made him one of the most listened to comedians in Australia. Now, now, I'm expecting indigestion to be born a room. Stomach aching out, mm. Hey, Dad, Dad, there's a young lady at the door. A young lady, the little trimmer. Uh, pronounce her, Harry. Uh, go on, open the door and uh, pronounce her. Miss Olivia Shakespeare. No, don't move. Just stand there. Oh, but how wonderful. Just like the three witches from Macbeth. Strike me lucky. Did you hear that? She said I had three witches and bad breath. <laughs> Hello? Yes, this is the Bob Dyer residence. Speaking. Mrs. Dyer? Oh, she's fine. Second victory law. You want me to go on tour? Yes, of course. Perth, Melbourne, Adelaide, Tasmania, Brisbane? Yes, of course, but uh, what'll I do for the people in Sydney? Give them a rest. Well? As long as I'm working for the government, I'd better get some practice. Oh. 
Well, with those feet, you'll make a good man for the job. What job? Stamping out bushfires. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have some gags. Brownie, bring me some gags, boy. Come on, daddy boy. Thank you, Brownie. Gags for the war loan, gags for the war. I've got it. Listen to this. The Bigger family. Mrs. Bigger weighs 16 stone, Mr. Bigger weighs 12 stone, and Baby Bigger weighs 3 stone. Who's the Bigger Bigger? Well, if Mrs. Bigger weighs more than Mr. Bigger, she must be the Bigger Bigger. No, no, you're wrong. Mr. Bigger's the Bigger because he's Father Bigger. Do you get it? Father Bigger. <laughs> Hello? City Sound Review, Ken Hall. Hello, Ken. You want me to make a picture? Sure, I've had experience. I made a picture in Hollywood. It was an educational picture. How do I know it was educational? <laughs> well, after they saw it, they said, that'll teach us a lesson. Same to you. Gags, gags, gags. Hey. I've got it. Listen to this. The Bigger family. Mrs. Bigger weighs 16 stone, Mr. Bigger weighs 12 stone, and Baby Bigger weighs 3 stone. Who's the Bigger Bigger? You've told me the answer. Mr. Bigger is the Bigger Bigger. No, Baby Bigger's the Bigger because he's a little bigger. You get it? <laughs> a little bigger. <laughs> no. Honey, I think you're a little tired. You're telling me. Let's go relax, huh? Okay. Well, Don, what do we do? Let's take a picture. No film. Let's make a record. No record. Let's finish the script. No jokes. Let's go talk to Mother. No, thanks. I got it. Hey, doll, come here. Don't go away. Listen, Mama Bigger and Baby Bigger. Papa Bigger's been called up. He's gone to war. Nobody home but Mama Bigger and Baby Bigger. Now, who's the bigger? Baby Bigger or Mama Bigger? Baby Bigger is still a little bigger. No, no, no. Baby Bigger is not the bigger. Mama Bigger's the bigger because Baby Bigger is father less. You get it? Father less. <laughs> <laughs> Sydney's traffic can't take it when crowds jam Pitt Street to get a view of a pram, a baby and a nursemaid. Finally, the baby has to be carried over the heads of the crowd to seek refuge in a shop, while sightseers still surge round the stunt started for the sake of somebody's soap. What caused it all? For the explanation, we take you to a Sydney radio theatre for Bob Dyer's session, Can You Take It? The stunt was a penalty for a man failing to answer the question, what gets bigger the more you take out of it? The answer being a hole. But Bob pays off. All right, all right, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Ray Mitchell, your penalty will be to wheel this pram with Rod Holmes along Pitt Street tomorrow afternoon at 1.30 from King to Market Street. If you do that, you will come back here next Monday and receive 50 pounds for paying the penalty. Can you take it? Yes. He can take it! I'll, I'll, I'll have the baby say hello to the new nursemaid. Say hello to the new nursemaid. Hello, Nursey. There are other penalties, too. Now, don't forget, your wife is on the telephone. You pick up the receiver and talk to her, and if you can convince her that you're at a mutual friend's house, I'll give you an extra five pounds. You right? right? All right, now pick up the telephone and talk to her. <laughs> hello, darling. Hello, 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 darling. Hello, darling. This is Noel. Yes, my husband. Yes. Darling, I'm at Ralph's place. <laughs> I'm at Ralph's place. Wait a moment, darling. wait a moment. She said she says you're drunk. No. Uh, I'm not drunk, darling. This girl, failing to answer a riddle, has the task of choosing the ripest of three melons to win a consolation prize. All the melons have got more hair than Bob Dyer. He's the one on the left. Please. <laughs> you select, you can take home with you, right? Now, just over here, thump this one. And here's the second one. <laughs> and there's the third one. Now, which one do you pick? The middle one! Now, wait a moment, there's only one way to find out. Here's a knife. Now, it's right on top of the melon. And now, go when I count three, cut. One, two, three! <laughs> At a big Sydney store, Radio Quizmaster Bob Dyer takes over the microphone in a new role. What's he getting his Macintosh on for? No rain about, surely. Oh no, he's judge in a personality baby quest, and he's taking no chances. After all, he's an expert on cop the lot. One of these little darlings might decide to play Can You Take It with Uncle Bob on the receiving end. 
Okay, kid, Bob's waiting anxiously. He's not so bad, really. But he did nearly drop one of the little deers on its head. It couldn't say dead at daddy, it said dead at Davy. And watch Bob get rid of this one, like a slap-happy pappy with one eye on the nappy. He may be a dyer, but he's no cleaner. It'll be so funny. Don't worry, kid, he won't use you for bait when he goes deep sea fishing. And you are one of the semi-finalists, chosen from thousands of photographs. You could win a magnificent set of gold-plated nappy pins. Oh, sorry, wrong program. <laughs> Faced by a radio star and all she can do is static. Come on, pick a box. If television's going to be like this, here's one baby that's voting for Prohibition. Hi-ho, everyone. Oh, sorry, wrong program again. Well, here's an easy-going customer anyway. Just pass him over, Mum, and Bob's his uncle. Well, look, here's one actually smiling. Probably a ring-in from Give It A Go. This little darling puts a thumb in her mouth just to show there's a sucker born every minute. And Bob, with a dozen mothers ready to run hat pins through him if he picks the wrong box, uh, sorry, baby, reckons she ain't kidding. He's all set to take it from here. Quiet now, kids, here's the winner, William George Falconer of Randwick. The punters give him a great reception as he beats Roger Gregory Bergen in a photo finish. Hey, Bob Down, you're spotted. Another comedy star to emerge from the Colgate Palmolive radio programs was Willie Fennell, the original little Aussie battler. His characterization of the little man who tried everything but couldn't make a go of anything endeared him to radio audiences for almost 20 years.
Bentley, who had found stardom in London, appearing in the BBC radio classic Take It From Here, returned to Australia in 1955 to star in a short-lived ABC radio comedy series, Gently Bentley. Now, I suppose you're wondering exactly why the wild colonial boys returns. Well, I'll tell you a story. Years ago, in the days of sailing ships, they had a race from Australia to England to see who could take the most corn from Australia to England. That race was won by my old grandfather, by Carbonet Bentley, one of the first settlers, incidentally. So I am carrying on in the same tradition, except that I am bringing the corn back from England to Australia. One of the most unusual radio programs of the late 1940s was The Piddington Show. Sid Piddington had developed a thought transference act in Changi during his time as a prisoner of war. And following his return to Australia, he refined his technique and brought his ESP act to radio with the assistance of his wife, Leslie Pope. Judges to come forward from the audience. Uh, would you come forward, please? And just stand on my right. Would you come forward? And I want you to uh, blindfold my wife with these two uh, cotton wool pads and this handkerchief. Now, for this test, I want you to step forward and to select one book. Make certain you have a free choice. Just pick up any book. Right, thank you. Now, I want you to open the book at any page. And now, from that page, just select any line. And then, uh, would you be good enough to show it to the audience? Thank you. Now, uh, would you take the chalk and uh, print the line uh, uh, for the audience on this blackboard? I will now attempt to transmit this line to my wife. And it is now that I most earnestly ask for your sympathy and uh, concentration. Please concentrate on the line. Building. Um, somebody in a building. A bank. And uh, People in a, it's a town. No, I concentrate on the name of the town. H, A, uh, no, I can't get the town. A, a banker. There's a name there. Concentrate on the surname, please. S. Sun. Sing. I'll give you the line I've received. Just like the people of... That's the name of the town. The banker, W. Sing. Is that near enough, boys? Yeah. Of the many talent quests that blossomed on radio during the 1940s and 50s, Australia's Amateur Hour is perhaps the best remembered. 
Broadcast nationally over a network of 54 commercial radio stations, the program was sponsored by Lever Brothers for all of its 20-year run. Harry Durth, Dick Fair and Terry Deer all served as the show's compere, introducing thousands of young hopefuls in their quest for stardom, many of whom actually found the success they were seeking. If Australia's Amateur Hour was the best remembered of the radio talent shows, Mobile Quest was undoubtedly the most prestigious. Produced in Melbourne by Crawford Productions, Mobile Quest was a stylish program from beginning to end. Everyone wore dinner suits or evening dresses for all heats and finals. Competitors were given full accompaniment for their presentations of songs or arias from opera by the Mobile Quest Concert Orchestra under the direction of Hector Crawford.
Radio drama was always very popular in Australia. Described by some as the theatre of the mind, it filled a cultural gap for many listeners, allowing them to hear radio adaptations of some of the great literary classics. Yes, darling. No, 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 I've got all the time in the world. Of course I can come round now, I'll be there in two minutes. Hmm? <laughs> Goodbye, darling. <clears throat> that was my grandmother. She's very ill. She wants me to go over at once. See you later, Martin. No, this is not Mr. Saunders. Mr. Saunders has just gone to see his grandmother. <laughs> the dear old lady is dying. Goodbye. Grandmother, my eye. Who is it? Me, darling. Oh, come in, Jim. Oh, Jill, it's so good to see you again. Oh, kiss me, darling. Jim, dear, Grant phoned me this morning. Grant phoned you? What about? About a lot of things, Mr. Saunders. I told you I'd get you. And here it is. <coughs> Stop him, Jill. He jumped through the window. Are you all right, dear? Yes, I'm okay. The ABC was the first radio organisation in Australia to broadcast plays and serials on a regular basis. Presenting another episode in the series, Mount Mason Murders. In our last broadcast, you remember, Inspector Feathers was on his way to historic Mount Mason. I don't like this business, Sergeant. Hey, careful. He'll have us off the road. I'll tell me to drive as fast as I could, Inspector. But not like a madman. Look out! <laughs> You all right, Feathers? Oh! Oh! Just my shoulder, I think. Commercial radio soon followed the ABC with programmes such as Caltex Theatre, The General Motors Hour, Macquarie Theatre, Harry Dirth's Playhouse and the Lux Radio Theatre. The plays were always performed before an audience in the station's auditoriums and the actors always wore evening clothes. Uh, it's Uncle the Ghost. But you can't shoot a ghost. Uncle can. Here, quickly, get out of the way or he might shoot you. I'm going to see what's happening. Uncle, Uncle, where are you? Uh, uh, did you see him? Who? Uh, the ghost. Oh, stop pointing that gun at me. It might go off. Uh, this? <laughs> it's not loaded. See? Uh, oh, come, you on, come on, man. Take his leg. Oh, the lights are out. Drag him off my neck. Oh, he bit me. Oh, stop twisting my arm. Look out. Let me crack him one. It's the butler. Oh. The high standard of the Sunday night plays prompted Macquarie Broadcasting to initiate an annual award known as the Macquarie Award, which was presented to the actor and actress who gave the best performance in the Caltex Theatre. The award ceremonies were glamorous and prestigious occasions and were held in the Macquarie Auditorium in Sydney. It gives me very great pleasure to present the Macquarie Awards for 1946. Firstly, to Miss Catherine Duncan for her starring role in, as Fräulein von Bernberg in Children and Uniform. Thank you very much, Mr. Dennison. I'm very honoured to be sharing this award with such fine artists. In Indian Summer, Miss Linda Barber. <laughs> John Nugent Hayward for his featured role as Gripo in The Duke in Darkness. Now to Mr. Peter Finch for his male starring role as Rene Latour in The Laughing Woman. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'm a. Uh... Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> Evie Hayes, stage star of Call Me Madam, presents the Macquarie Awards for 1953 at a special ceremony in Sydney. Margaret Christensen receives a bronze statuette and a hundred guineas for her award as Outstanding Actress of the Year. 
A similar award goes to Lloyd Burrell, chosen as the best actor. Lloyd hasn't forgotten to shave for the big occasion. He's growing that beard for a film role. So as far as he is concerned, the winner's no close shave. Veteran trooper Minnie Love gets a big reception as Best Supporting Actress. She, Barry Cookson, Best Supporting Actor, and Kevin Brennan, Best Comedy Role, each get 50 guineas. It's a big night for radio stars. One of the great pioneers of the Australian radio serial was undoubtedly George Edwards, the man of a thousand voices. He was an outstanding actor and had the ability to play many different parts in each of his serials. In 1937, George Edwards and his wife, Nell Sterling, brought Dad and Dave to radio, beginning what was to be a marathon 15-year run. Dad and Dave was distinctly Australian as it was based on the characters created by Steele Rudd in his book, On Our Selection. I wish I could help you, Dan. I've been adding up these figures and working out the interest and looking at my bank book and I can't let your mother down. Well, what can we do, Dan? What do you mean, what can we do? You can't do anything. You're right, I can. Your troubles are my troubles. Good on you, Dave. I know how hard Mum's worked. A few years earlier, Ken G. Hall had scored an outstanding success with a series of films for Cine Sound Productions based on the same book. Big mug. <laughs> Look, I got an idea. Here, catch hold of that pedestrian refugee there. Come on, Mum. Here, get in between us. Put that down. What you want on these corners is gates. If these mugs and the cars have to get out and open them, that'd slow down the traffic. Yeah, I'll mention that to the department. Yeah. Come on. While Dad and Dave brought the flavour of the country to radio, Fred and Maggie reflected life in modern suburbia. Starring the real-life husband and wife team of Edward Howell and Therese Desmond, Fred and Maggie became the longest-running situation comedy series on Australian radio. How many coupons have you got left, Fred? What's that? How many coupons have you got left, dear? Not very many. Why, Maggie? Well, I wanted you to lend me some. I, I must try and get some towels somehow. Now, look, dear, if you haven't got enough coupons to buy towels, how are you going to pay me back any that I lend you? Yes, well, I hadn't started to think about that, Fred. I only thought how awful the towels were. They're all falling to pieces. And then I thought yes, that Well, you... all right, dear, I haven't started to think about it at all yet. But when I do, I... By the late 1930s, most of the commercial radio stations throughout Australia were featuring serials as a staple part of their broadcast schedules. One of the most popular starred Athel Tear and Dan Agar, who provided the voices for two gossiping housewives known as Mrs. Arris and Mrs. Eggs. Once, didn't she? Yes, and she complained to the steward that a sailor peeped in her cabin one night. Well, I never. A sailor? Now, what did the steward say? He said, oh, well, that's all right. Uh, who, who does you expect when, when you travel second class? The captain? The captain? <laughs> this was the forerunner to the classic comedy serial of the 1940s, Mrs. Obbs. Guy Dolman and Thelma Scott brought all the mystery and romance under the big top to life in Hagen Circus, while the real-life story of Australian women at war was being told by an almost all-female cast in White Coolies. Adapted for radio from the diaries written in secret by Sister Betty Jeffrey during her three and a half years as a prisoner of the Japanese during World War II, White Coolies was dedicated to those Australian Army nursing sisters who did not return. AWA's When a Girl Marries, which starred Ron Randall and Marie Clark, also carried a dedication, but it was aimed at a vastly different audience. Presenting Chapter One of When a Girl Marries, dedicated to those who are in love and to all those who can remember. But it was the daytime serials produced for Housewives by Grace Gibson Radio Productions that proved to have the most enduring appeal. Portia faces life. The story of a courageous and beautiful woman.
we bring you radio's great story of adult love. The story of Dr. Paul. Are you awake, darling? Uh, uh, yes, Virginia, I'm awake. Mm, I thought you might be. How did you sleep? Oh, sir, sir. Um, you? Much the same. What time does the sitting commence for? At ten. Are you worried? Well, I'm not really looking forward to it, Virginia. I wish you'd let me come with no. you. No, I'd much rather you didn't. But why not, Paul? At a time like this, surely it would help having me there. It would help me no end, but it's also likely to upset you. Oh, don't be silly, as though that matters. Well, it does matter. It matters to me. I don't want you upset. But, darling, if it would help you... Virginia, this is likely to be very nasty. And there's no telling what June Ritchie's likely to say, and I'd much prefer that you stayed well away. Is it because she's going to claim that Eileen Preston's in love with you? Oh, Paul, as though that matters. Well, you've let talk of Eileen Preston upset you before. Of course it upsets me. But I repeat, what does it matter about me? You're the one to be considered today. You're the one who needs some help and some moral support. And I'd like to be around to give it to you. Now, look. You stay home with Junior. I'll tell you all about it tonight. The radio programs produced for children were many and varied, and a great number of them encouraged their young audience not only to listen, but to participate. Are you ready, children? Here is Miss Ruth Fenner for kindergarten. The ABC's Kindergarten of the Air was broadcast nationally at 9.30 each morning, Monday to Saturday, and was squarely aimed at small children of preschool age. Good morning, children. How are all my little friends today? I can say good morning to you in all your homes and schools in every part of Australia. Now you say good morning to me. Good morning, Miss Fenner. Well, let's begin kindergarten this morning with some songs. We'll sing about Michael Finnegan. Everybody help me sing. You sing too. There was an old man named Michael Finnegan. He grew whiskers on his chinnigan. Older children were given the opportunity to perform live to air in the outstandingly successful Uncle Tom's Gang, which was broadcast six days a week from 2SM in Sydney. How old are you, Andrew? Seven, Uncle Tom. Seven. And what are you going to recite? The christening. The christening. Now, be. go on. The christening. What shall I call my dear little dormouse? His eyes are small and his tail is enormous. Keith Smith, who has a radio station, A Word from the Children, interviews youngsters in the street. Some of their remarks amuse their friends, but must amaze their parents. Who does the washing at your house? My father. Oh, what sort of a washerman is your father? Oh, a fairly good one. Oh, do you think that fathers should help mothers do the washing? Yes. Why? Oh, I think that they're stronger and uh, that the woman has to do the housework and uh, that father should help. I wonder who dirties all the clothes at your house? Eh? Hey? I suppose that'd be the worst. <laughs> Got any sisters? Ah, uh, yes, three. I guess they argue about something or other, do they? Yes, the youngest one, uh, Ethel. She's a bit of a troublemaker. Oh, what sort of arguments does she indulge in? Big words. Well, if, uh, if she has a tea set or something, then I, uh, happen to smash it accidentally, well, then I'm in a bit of strife with everybody. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> but, uh, who would you rather have to smack you, mother or father? My dad. Why is that? Oh, well, Mum hurts the most. <laughs> Ever talk Dad out of smacking you? Oh, yes. One day I used to link all over the wall and I talked him out of it. <laughs> and when you grow up and get married, and if you have children, will you smack them as your father smacks you? Yes. Why? Oh. Uh, See? Oh, uh, because they're naughty, they deserve it. How old are you? Seven. Uh, eight. Oh, you're eight now, are you? Oh, it didn't take long, did it? <laughs> uh, do you think that fathers should help mothers to uh, 
Do the housework? Yes. Why? Because hmm? the mothers have to make the beds and wash up the dishes. Doesn't Father ever wash up the dishes at your house? Yes, on Mother's Day he made the breakfast for Mother. Two UE's Rumpus Room was a late afternoon program for teenagers in which compere Howard Craven played all the popular music of the time and gave members of the studio audience the opportunity to sing, answer quiz questions or simply air their views on various subjects. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and teenagers everywhere. This is Howard Craven in... Well, here we go again with another special road safety edition of our Rumpus Room program. At the piano, we say good evening to... Frank Scott. Ready to go, Scotty? Right away, Howard. All right, this is this. Now, let's get down to business. Here we go. Well, it looks as if we have the first comment in Rumpus Room this evening. Down we go with the microphone to... Wendy Howard of Coogee. Good evening, Wendy. Welcome to Rumpus Room. Thank you, Mr. Craven. I'd like to make a comment on road safety. Well, we'd like to hear it, Wendy. What do you say? Well, I think the point that we must emphasize is that every person must realize his own responsibility. Yes. It is the individual that counts. Mm. Every person must know his rules mm. and adhere to them at all times. Well, that sounds very sensible to me. Do you know all the road safety rules, Wendy? Well, I know a lot of them. Good, I'm glad to hear it. A very good comment, well made, from... Wendy Harden of Coogee. Thank you very much, Wendy. Well, the girls have opened the show very successfully with a very good point. Have the men anything to say for themselves? Just ah, uh, Good, across we go to... Uh, John Pond of Centennial Park. Well, good evening to you. John, you have something to say? I'd like to make a comment on road safety, please, Mr. Craven. <laughs> What did that mean to you, John? The, the notes of the road safety were on. You're quite right. Well, I was speaking to you as the notes were played, which gives you an opportunity to answer a road safety question for ten shillings. Like to try and answer it? Certainly would. All right, here we go. John, how would you cross a road? Oh, well, you'd look to the right, to the left, and look to the right, and make sure that there were no vehicles crossing. Then you'd coming, or rather, I should say, yeah. and just walk straight across, briskly. Just walk briskly across. That's I right. See. Anything else to say? No, I don't think so, now. Well, I mean, John, for example, would you walk briskly in that direction or that no, direction? Um, horizontal. Um, <laughs> right angles. Horizontally. Right angles. That's the point we want to make. Well said, John. Take ten shillings. Thank you very much, Mr. Craig. Thank you very much. Well, on we go with the show. Let's see. Down over here. Hello? Oh, hello. What's your name? Uh, Dennis Baxter of Enfield. How do you do? Dennis, have you anything to say on the subject of road safety? Well, not really, no. I, road safety doesn't interest me. I don't... Uh, drive a car or ride a bicycle. But Dennis, uh, you do use the roadways, don't you? You use the footpaths. You are a pedestrian. Yes. Well, Dennis, believe me, road safety concerns all of us. Those of us here in Rumpus Room this afternoon, those who may be listening to us, and those who are watching us. When the Quiz Kids came to radio in 1942, it was a serious attempt to test the general knowledge of school children. What is the Dunmo Flitch? Well, it was a flitch of bacon that was awarded in England. Compare John Deese had been a school teacher before coming to radio, and his approach to the role of quizmaster gave the program an intellectual credibility. One of the few children's adventure serials to survive the onslaught of television in Australia was The Air Adventures of Hop Harrigan. Based on the American radio series and the 15-chapter motion picture serial produced by Columbia Pictures in 1946, the Australian version of Hop Harrigan was fast-paced, full of action, and as a result could be heard broadcast throughout Australia well into the 1960s. The Air Adventures of Hop Harrigan. Australian star who's made good on American and British television arrives by plane at Kingsford Smith Airport, Sydney. Yes, sir, that's a box of real cactus flowers for Smokey Dawson, back in Australia to fulfill a commercial radio contract. Riding, riding. Smokey Dawson was a real-life outback hero to a whole generation of Australian children. His radio programs were all sponsored by Kellogg's and were designed as an Australian version of the Gene Autry Roy Rogers Singing Cowboy Westerns in America. Together with his famous horse Flash, Smokey Dawson rode the Australian outback from his legendary Jindawarrabal station, always on the side of good and continually bringing evil doers to justice. Come Flash! Adventure with Smokey Dawson. 
Then, well, I had a trick or two up my sleeve. If I could just get a chance to use them. Like the fur trapper's rifle that I could attach to my innocent looking guitar. Okay, Steve, get cracking. What happened to that fool, Ed? Hey, say good afternoon to the gentleman, Flash. Come on. That's the boy. Guns! What? Some hideout, you think? What comes next, the dancing girls? Come on, you. Get out. Uh, I don't get it, Steve. Maybe some circus. Reach, dude. That's right. I am from a circus. I was just riding through. Going, Steve, I'll handle this. You better. I will. It'll be a pushover. Come on, get back and around. Come on, come on, get around. Come on, come on. Get out. Now, good luck, Steve. I'll see you. Stop your guns and reach. Now, don't try anything else. Get down there and turn around. Come on, up to it. Now, spread out and keep those hands up. Keep an eye on flesh. Friendship, gold and friendship. Treasure it while you can. Try a little friendship, and you'll be a happier man. The federal capital, home of words. Now more words will go on the air. The new 2CA Canberra and Crazy Davy gives the station a healthy start. 2CA Canberra calling 2GB Sydney from the Australian capital, Canberra, and on the station platform. What a day, what a glorious day. The sun's shining and it's ready to go right ahead now for those marvellous exercises that pull off so much weight in the right places. So let's get down to business first off, everybody. Down you sit, nice and comfortably. It's the posy bumper. This is the one that takes it off where the arches used to be. When I say lift, lift, when I say bump, bump in a big way. A little music, John. Up you go now. Bump, everybody. Up again now. Bump. Oh, put more into it. Up you go now. Bump. Nice going. One more. Up you go. Let her down. Good work, everybody. Once more. Up you go. Down she comes. That's marvelous. Last one. One on the house. Up she comes. Whamsy. Good business. While most of the big network programs originated from Sydney or Melbourne, the country radio stations of Australia played an important role in servicing the needs of their local communities. The pace of country radio was much slower than its city counterpart. It concentrated on helping to solve the problems of its listeners, broadcasting programs of special interest to the man on the land, and passing on the benefits of specialised knowledge and experienced up-to-the-minute advice on current farming procedures. And in cases of emergency, local community radio was the first line of communication. We interrupt this program to bring you a special message from Bushfire Control Headquarters. A report from Zone 38 states that a grass fire is burning on Mr. E.A. McDonald's property. Would all members of volunteer firefighting units... A radio reporter on the spot and walkie-talkie contact with the station could bring immediate reserves to a trouble zone. During the devastating Hunter River floods in 1955, 12 of the local radio stations banded together and remained on air right around the clock, directing rescue operations, passing on urgent messages to anxious relatives, and broadcasting warnings in the cause of public safety.
it was a clear demonstration of local community radio at its best. In 1957, Jack Davey celebrated 25 years as a commentator on the Australian movie tone newsreels. His activities created nationwide interest during his years as undisputed king of the airwaves. And despite his phenomenal success on radio, he insisted on maintaining his association with movie tone, often appearing on screen in special features. Whether he was driving around Australia in a Red X trial, shark fishing with Sir Robert George, the Governor of South Australia, or entertaining disabled children aboard his 70-foot cruiser Sea Mist, the Movie Tone newsreel cameras were on hand to capture it all. At Movie Tone, with such a grand team to work with, it hasn't been like work, it's been more like play. It's had its serious side and its funny side. All that's been recorded on film. We've had some colossal highlights. In fact, it might be an idea right now to look back over the last 25 years to see some of the highlights I've had the pleasure of bringing you. The stork's been working overtime at Taronga Park, Sydney. The baby zebra has the same design for living as mum and dad. Small fry everywhere. I didn't want to be a monkey, says this one. There's too many of them hanging around as it is. Well, they've made a monkey out of you, brother, so that's how you'll stay. All this is too much for Sir Edward Hallstrom, so he calls in our old friend, Matron Davy. She's a whiz when it comes to weaning a weenie wombat. A wombat is like any other baby when it's full. It needs winding. That's the boy. Baby roos sometimes must have their temperatures taken. This one's ill. Too many hops. You've been a good boy, so here's two bob to put in your pocket. Baby rabbits are littered all over the place, and for want of proper postnatal care, the mortality rate is especially high. It's one of Australia's problems. Matron Davy gives special attention to the care of these helpless youngsters, and is devoting much spare time to finding an antidote to myxomatosis. It takes a stout um, heart to penetrate into the pen of an expectant ostrich, but Matron Davy has it. As fine a setting of eggs as you'd meet up with anywhere. At present prices, I'd say a bargain lot, all approved by the egg board. One ostrich egg is very like another to the average person, but to Matron Davy, each one has its own individuality. Tuning in on the stethoscope is the best way to find out if the young ostrich is happy and contented in its shell. But there's something unusual here. This one sounds addled. There's nothing more irritating to a mother ostrich than to give birth to an omelet. Ah, it looks as if there's been a nigger in the woodpile. Says Mrs. Ostrich, you can't blame me, it was dark. Matron Davy says, dark nothing, that's a white tomcat if ever I've seen one. It goes to show, it's often difficult to tell just who's zoo who at the zoo. The merry, merry month of May brings the willing shilling drive, and guides and brownies go about their work earning a barber job. Funds raised in this way are used to further the movement, and State President Lady Woodward lends personal encouragement. There's never any shortage of odd jobs. Consequently, there's always room for volunteers. Girl guide Gertie Davy, as usual, is always first in for the toughest tasks. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Girl guide Gertie Davy, sir. Brownie squad, horror section. It's a willing shilling week, sir. Would you have a job for a bob? Oh, let me see. Um... Well, actually, it's the army ball tonight, and I'd like to see all the men attend. Um, do you think you could guard the ammunition dump for us? Goodness me, sir, just a job for me. Ammunition dump. Yes. My word, sir. Well, <clears throat> come with me. Well, it certainly looks like there's a good job in store for Gertie. Well, <clears throat> there you are. There's over 1,000 tons of high explosive right here. 
Your job is to guard it from now till dawn. Very good, sir. And uh, here's your shilling. Thank you very much, sir. Gertie takes stock of the TNT and settles down for the night. <laughs> Meanwhile, over at the Premier's office, Mr. Cowell signs on a temporary team of private secretaries. <laughs> but comes midnight, and Gertie Davy is still on the job. Next morning, things look very black. All right, I've tried everything else. This is your last chance, or I give the order to fire. Oh, all right. There's your shilling. Thank you. Jack Davy was always happy to be involved in a gag, even if the joke was on himself. On this occasion, the cameras caught him in a tough spot, pitting his skill against the patience and paws of a pal. A somewhat unusual scene that was bound to arouse the curiosity of passers-by. You got me, brother? My, what a clever dog. Oh, he's not that clever. We played five games this morning and that's the first one he's won. Not even the drenching rain could dampen the spirits of those two kings of comedy, Jack Davy and Bob Hope, when they visited the Lakes Golf Club in Sydney for a charity match on a bleak midwinter's day. Be here, and I want to thank Jack Davy for handling all these uh, uh, ceremonies out here. And I was on his show just a few nights ago, and I'm sure that he's big enough to make a comeback. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you, fool. Back. my only shot of the day, get it. <laughs> I faint right after this. <laughs> In 1959, the Australian Wool Bureau instigated Wool Week, a promotion designed to promote Australian woolen fabrics around the world. And Jack Davy was nominated as Mr. Wool. As part of the promotion, he travelled to Hollywood, where he presented actress Jane Mansfield with a specially designed dress made from Australian wool. This material, this is Australian printed wool. And as I'm emphasizing wool wherever I can, the world over, I don't care where it comes from as long as it's wool, I brought this especially for you, Miss Mansfield. We've had it designed and we've had it made exactly to your size. That's beautiful, just beautiful. You like that material? Oh, I adore it. It's fabulous blue and green. Oh, the roses, too. <laughs> well, you know, the people would never forgive me if they didn't see it on. Oh, I'd love to put it on. Would, would you, you take do that? a moment if you went away from Right, me? if you will, because uh, I've got a little job to do okay. with Mr. Hargaday. I want to talk to him. I've got something for him as well. Don't tell me you brought it for me. Well, I can't think of anybody that would make a suit look better than you could. Oh, and so wonderful. This is uh, enough here for an Australian three-piece suit with two-piece suit. Uh, well, trousers. Very oh, very golly, size. It's beautiful. Well, that I, piece? I can't tell you how happy I am. And here's really. another piece that's probably a small for around wonderful. about half a five, but that's very beautiful. Thank you very much. Well, it's our... Look who's coming here. Oh, let's make room. Aren't you look beautiful? That's the truth. The most wonderful effect I've ever seen. It looked even better than I thought it would. Look, I've got something else as well. This is... This is magnificent. <laughs> I'd like you to take this. This is an Australian traveling rug or a car robe. Just the right colors for you and for you. I think that's a very nice one. But for me, Melbourne Cup time at Movie Tone has always been one of mixed fortunes. So you win, you lose. This particular year, things were really bright. And of course, I arrived to back a sure thing for the big race, prepared to put my coat, shirt, pants, car, and the lot on it. It uh, didn't win. Then there was the time when things weren't the best, but again, the information was that the favorite was a cert. This time it did win, and to that favorite I say thanks. Thanks a million. <laughs>